our next guest, although he's made an awful lot of money in his business endeavours over the years. He made, I think, about 50 million euro when he was involved in selling Airtricity, which he had founded back in 2008. He sold that. But he's back in Ireland looking to make a massive investment in wind energy, up to one and a half billion euro. That's Eddie O'Connor from Mainstream Renewable Power. Hello to you, Eddie. Hi, Matt. Now, Eddie, I've known you nearly 20 years. I knew you in the days when you were running semi-state uh, board Nomona, and you've come a long way from that. Uh, tell us, when you sold Airtricity back in 2008, were you not tempted to just go off into retirement and enjoy all that money? Not really, you know. I mean, I had the choice of becoming the, the world's best worst golfer uh, uh, and, and, and annoying Hildegard at home. Or, <laughs> or go and do what was actually needed to be done. The, the world is on a once-off transition to sustainability. And I reckon we had built a lot of the skills, a lot of the know-how, uh, particularly in things like offshore wind and, you know, cultural diversity, knowing how to walk into other countries and respect their cultures and be able to do business with them. We built up all this stuff. And I suppose if you've got energy, you still want to do what it was that you, yeah, personal energy you're talking about, you know. But why did you sell electricity, so? Well, I, it, <laughs> it wasn't my decision to sell electricity. Uh, it, it wasn't owned by me. I mean, I set the place up, but, but I had no money. coming you're out a small of the shareholding. Coming out of the semi-states, I had not a penny. I, I, we borrowed, a couple of us, I borrowed £20,000 and put in there. I had nothing. So I was very happy to finish up with, with the reported figure that you mentioned there. Uh, but it was it was other people's decision to sell it. Actually, they got the top of the market exactly right. So you have to say it was, a, it was a good decision. But you went back to get involved again, and you're involved in this company, Mainstream Renewable Power. Before we go back into your history in business, what exactly Mainstream Renewable Power, what ho- do you hope to do in Ireland now? Well, we've we, we've done this deal with Sinovel, um, a memorandum of understanding signed when it was off in Beijing there uh, two weeks ago. We hope to kickstart again uh, the Irish uh, wind industry, which has become stalled for various reasons. And we hope to build a thousand megawatts. Or we we intend to build a thousand megawatts at least over the next five years. What does a thousand megawatts mean? How big is that? Oh, well, I suppose the system in Ireland is about seven thousand megawatts in size at the moment. So we're with big ambitions uh, for this country. Okay, and where will you build it, and how? Well, it'll be wind energy, it'll be on land, mainly. Um, uh, technology in wind has changed a bit, actually, or, since, since I started out in this industry. The machines have got an awful lot bigger, they've got more reliable, and they can operate now in much lower wind speeds and still get good economic returns from it, like in, in the Midlands. Uh, the Midlands of Ireland, we used to think you couldn't put wind farms up there because there, was, there wasn't enough wind, but now you put them up on top of 100 metre towers and you have longer blades and, you know, it works very well. A lot of people are very suspicious of wind energy and say it's not suitable to Ireland. Indeed, I've heard people from the ESB in particular say, people in the Department of Energy, that you can't depend on the wind blowing enough for you, that you might have times where the gusts are going good all and that'll get you the electricity, but there's lots of times of calm where you can't generate and you'd have to store water apparently. Remember one ESB person saying you need to have a lake the size of Donegal to store all the water to make wind energy actually efficient in this country. Well, tell us, what is the situation? Well, the situation is, like everybody knows, you, you take the wind energy when it comes. Um, you can't actually dial it up like burning a fossil fuel and making it and, and turning it up and down. It happens when it happens. Now, there are strategies to deal with it, and, and one of the most expensive strategies is to try pump storage and to build a gigantic lake. I mean, that carries enormous environmental impacts with it. The best way to do it is to recognise that the wind is always blowing somewhere and that what we need is a big supergrid all across Europe, stretching down to Spain, stretching out into the North Atlantic, including Ireland and Britain, Germany, the Baltic. And the wind is always blowing somewhere there. So if you capture the wind along all those big areas... Well, then, you know, you have something like a very large nuclear power station. It's invariant. It just keeps on pumping out the, the megawatts. You can imagine a big storm arriving, you know, 400 miles from Ireland, and it waxes um, over Ireland, and then it wanes, but it's waxing again in England and as it tracks up towards Norway. Now, there are other such things as, like, storage in Norway. There's lots of storage from the in the hydro up there. There's lots of storage in the Alps. Um, but I think the main storage, and, and I think we will need storage, the main storage will be in the batteries of every car in Europe, which by 2030, I expect, will be 100% electric. And then when you say storage, when they'll be 
Well, at night when the wind is blowing, and uh, let's say we don't need our air conditioners on or we don't need heat, we don't have our factories going, well, then the wind energy goes into the batteries. It's stored there in the battery of your car and my car, which we drive very little. We just drive it into work. And there you plug it back into the grid. So the battery stands as a charged up piece of equipment, which when the grid begins to run low on power the next day, the electricity can flow from your battery back out to the grid. But is that an electricity provider's way of looking at it? I mean, what gives you confidence that people will actually want these electric cars to justify the investment you've made in supplying the electricity? Well, I, uh, because fossil fuels are at $110 per uh, per barrel at the moment. I read a report from Barclays yesterday and they're saying it's going to go up um, and it's going to keep on going up because all 130 big oil wells in the world are at their peak. I mean, we will discover more reserves, but we're probably discovering reserves that only provide one-sixth of what we're using. The investment, one and a half billion euro, which you intend investing in Ireland, where's the money going to come from? Well, largely, uh, we've been talking to the Chinese Development Bank. We had a tremendous uh, rapport. We set up a tremendous rapport with them. You see, I, I see China as just a great place for Ireland to do business with. I mean, America was a great place for Ireland to do business with because they needed access to Europe at the end of the 80s and, and into the 90s. And that 56 American multinationals created the Celtic Tiger. Uh, now we have to look to the future. Who's going to be, by, the, by, by, I think, 2027, China will be the biggest economy again in the world. It was always the biggest economy up to 1800, and it's going to be the biggest again. China, you know, is a very rational type of place. It, it, it seems to be able to handle enormous growth and do it uh, seamlessly. And they have disposable amounts of money, and the government has said to them, go out and sell your technology. Uh, If you sell the technology like Sinovels, wind turbines, or SunTex, solar panels, which we're, uh, you know, we're going to do a a big deal with with them as well. Um, And we're already, uh, we've already done a big project in Illinois, in the United States, with Goldwind. So we're, we're several Chinese technology providers. Well, the Chinese banks will back their technology. And then the Chinese owners... So, sorry, so they will lend the money to yes. you to buy the Chinese stuff? Absolutely. It makes very good sense. And then at the end of the day, the, the owners uh, of the uh, generation companies in China uh, will come along and, and they will buy the, the built power stations. So for Ireland, it's, a no, it's, it's an absolutely no-lose situation. But what do the Chinese make of Ireland? Are they not worried by our desperate financial economic troubles at present? Well, I... I'm not inclined to agree, Matt, that they're as desperate as everybody makes them out to be. I mean, I think Ireland is... It should not be compared with Greece. I don't think Ireland should be compared with Greece. I'm, I'm very confident about the Why future not? of Ireland. Ireland is a, is a profoundly manufacturing company at the moment based on high-tech new industries. We never were when, when, when you and I were born. Uh, there was no practically no industries apart from Waterford Glass and, and a few co-ops. There was nothing around. Now we, we uh, 32% of our, of our wealth comes from manufacturing industry. We're the highest in the world. Actually, we're even higher than Germany. I see that, you know, when, it, when a big multinational moves away from Ireland, that doesn't mean the jobs cease. Because now the people know about the risks involved here. They know about the technologies. I mean, people who are married to my cousins over in Galway, you know, have set up their own businesses when, when the Digital Equipment Corporation went, went missing. So, you know, we, we're learning all the time. We're very bright people. We're learning. I think there's a... There's a huge future for Ireland and the big future for Ireland. One of the big futures is exporting wind to a power-hungry Europe. Well, I'll come back to the second, the opportunities and the government attitude towards that. But what about, well, how will you explain to Chinese nimbyism? You know, this thing about not building in my backyard. This whole thing about people around the country do not want having wind turbines within their line of sight or anything like that. Well, I mean, Ireland is one of the easiest uh, places to build. We have a time-bound planning system here, which is absolutely wonderful. A time-bound planning system means you get your yes or no uh, within, I think it's six months, I can't remember what exactly it is, and then you can be appealed to a board planola, which will give you a determination in four months. So you know in ten months what's going to happen. I mean, I've, I've built now at this stage in Scotland, tried to do something in Wales, tried to do something in England, tried to do something in New England and Texas. There's only one place better than Ireland for getting planning permissions, and that's Texas where you don't need any permission at all. Uh, Ireland is a very good place uh, to build. Uh, it's, it's, and, and it's not corrupt. We don't have a corrupt system here. You do your environmental impact statements. They're as rigorous as, as, as are demanded of us, and we're quite happy to comply because we know that we've nothing to fear. 
uh, we're up in the air, we're taking energy out of the air here. And, and by and large, the Irish people go along with this. I mean, that, that old argument about Ireland, uh, NIMBYs in Ireland, is really not... I mean, we're not going to put stuff on the ring at Kerry particularly, or we're not going to put stuff where... Particularly, I hope not at all, Eddie. Where, well, where we get, where we get, you know, lots of tourists coming along who, 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 you know, want to see the view that, that we, we, we say is, this is Ireland, this is the way Ireland is native. That's great. Uh, so, but there's lots of other areas. I mean, Ireland is not all one big beauty spot. <laughs> Entrepreneur Eddie O'Connor is with us from Mainstream Renewable Power. Eddie was once the chief executive of Board Namona. He founded Airtricity and sold it three years ago, and he now is investing up to one and a half billion in wind energy in Ireland. All onshore? Would you ever consider offshore as well? Yeah, uh, you see, you build offshore when you can't build onshore. I mean, Britain finds it very hard, as I was saying, to get planning permission. Uh, the, the NIMBYism is huge. I mean, there's 63 million people living in England and Wales, and and it's very hard to get planning permission. It's easier in Scotland, uh, but they'll probably just do 6,000 megawatts. I mean, the British government hopes to build 25,000 megawatts offshore by 2020, uh, and they'll get a large part of that way. We in Ireland have a very small population, even though it's gone up to 4.5 million, we still have large tracts of this country, like the Midlands, like Mayo, uh, where you can put a lot of wind turbines. So uh, we, we should build out on land before we go offshore. The reason we should do that is because it costs half the price. Now, we are the world, mainstream renewable power are the world leaders in, in offshore wind. We built the Arklow Banks wind farm here with uh, General Electric uh, with no help from the state at all. People just don't believe me when I say that, but there's still, uh, last week I was down there playing some golf with the European and I saw all seven of them running. Yeah, and some of us was wondering, why is there only seven? Wasn't there supposed to be up to a hundred of them? Oh, well, I mean, we just built seven, uh, 25 megawatts, enough to supply uh, Arklow Town and all the hinterland there and it's free power, and no matter what happens to gasoline or what happens to diesel or anything like that, they'll just go on pumping out the megawatts, and it'll be there in 100 years, Matt. Those seven turbines will be standing in 100 years. How much help do you get from the government when you're proposing to bring in one and a half billion investment and all the money is supposed to be coming from China? Is there an open door for you now with civil servants saying, let's help you out, Eddie? Well, I, I've talked to, um, you know, the, the organs, the IDA and, and, and uh, Forfoss, and I would say yes. I mean, they're looking around the world at where... I mean, the world is awash with capital, but you have to actually find it. And you have to go out and aggressively market yourself to those people. So we have to, you know, we can't just wait for the Chinese to come to us. We're one of 180 nations in the world. And we've got to go out and point out how Ireland is a very stable place to do business in. Once you do a deal here in Ireland, rule of law applies. Very good. But hold on. A few years ago, didn't you say the civil servants had told you that what they were determined to make sure is that you'd never become a millionaire <laughs> and that they weren't going to allow you to do damage to the ESB? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah, I had forgotten that entirely. Uh, yeah, but times change. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I don't hold any, uh, skepticism or bitterness about that really because, you know, uh, you, you mentioned a figure that I'm alleged to have made, you know, so, I mean, that kind of, uh. <laughs> yeah, but no, is there not, is there an attitude? Because, I mean, going back a bit, you ran Borden Amon in a very entrepreneurial way. You left Bordenamona after something of a major row and major controversy at the time and headed off into the private sector. So was there a residual sort of bitterness against you from former uh, from state employees knowing where you had come from, which made it more difficult for you in the private sector? I, I would have to say not really. Uh, I mean, everybody moves on. Um, the same civil servants who would not have been particular admirers of mine, uh, they... You know, they moved on. They're on seven-year appointments, and they moved on. And, and the whole thing changes, and Ireland changes. And you get on with life. We've only got one of them. Um, and uh, just as just as I changed my life completely, uh, so, so did... Um, and, you know, I mean, the civil service were not as big in favour of wind energy as they are now. But they do seem to recognise that we can finish up exporting huge quantities of wind energy from this country if we all pull together. I'm going to go back to something you've probably put out of your mind, but the whole circumstances in which you left Borden and Mona, because I remember I covered it extensively as a business journalist at the time. You had made a speech, been very critical of the dead hand of the public service in, in stopping you trying to develop Borden and Mona the way you wanted. And the retribution, I think it's fair to say, that happened quite swiftly afterwards is that details of your expenses were leaked and it caused an enormous fuss and you ended up leaving Borden and Mona. How do you feel about all of that now? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I was being paid, I think, 66,000, right? 
uh, when I joined Board of Mona, um, Brendan Halligan was the chairman, and he said to me, Eddie, I'd like you to come and work in Board of Mona. Uh, it's a five-year contract. Um, I'd like you to work for £33,000 a year. And I said, Brendan, I'm earning £36,000 in a job that's permanent and pensionable in the ESB. Uh, I'd like to help you. Uh, but how can I go? Well, they're, well, they're the guidelines, he said. I said, well, I'm not going to go there. So he said, right, there has to be a whole lot of things done for you. Four holidays a year, various, uh, yes, there was, well, very little, a thousand pounds a month for, for entertainment. You have to get known on the Dublin scene. I mean, by the time I, I left there, it was, it was trivial. It was all just mainly to do with the speech and the attitude that I had. And I was getting fed up with all that stuff, and it was time I moved on. And as my wife said to me, uh, imaginative new ideas. But hold on, Were, weren't problems. you known? You, you have to change your term. Weren't you known in your student days as Red Eddie? Weren't you almost almost in the Richard Boyd Barrett school of approach to economics? Well, what age is Richard? He's in his forties. Right. Well, you see, um, when people talk about me as Red Eddie, I was twenty, and I was president of the students' council. And, and a job that I, I think I, I modestly says he, I, th- I think I did a great job at it, but it was my first management experience. So, you know, after that, you, 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 you learn what life is all about. I mean, it was part of learning. Yes, I mean, I did have a very open attitude towards and, and would still say that the likes of Marx has, has advanced economic theory. He invented the average law of profit. Uh, but I would also have studied all the other masters in the meantime and, and, um, you know, Confucius points out how you get wiser as you get older, and that's why they respect uh, us guys with grey hair in China. What future do you see for Ireland now? I think Ireland is is uh, has got to ride through this. The government has to be strong and it has to be tough. It has to cut, uh, uh, you know, the public service. I mean, everybody else is saying that, and we have to get the banks in order. We probably, we probably have, we'll have two banks and then one because one will get sold. Uh, we don't need the plethora of banks that we have here. And then I see the government has to be on top of it, as well as doing that, it has to get very entrepreneurial. I see great change coming. I don't see us, I don't see leaving the euro as any kind of an option at all. I think Ireland uh, is, is, when we get through this, I think Ireland is going to actually learn a hell of a lot. But, but what and this you won't say, happen again. But what do you crisis. say to the people say that the people who are offering the prognosis like you do are the people who are responsible for getting us into the mess in the first place? Well, I mean, I don't see anybody's going to argue that I got anybody no, into No, not you mess. personally, but that sort of attitude, you know, that it's all about, oh, let's cut the public service. I and mean, the public service wasn't responsible for the mess we got into. So why should all the people in public service lose their jobs or take pay cuts to compensate for what the builders and the bankers and the politicians did? You know, Matt, it, living in the real world imposes certain disciplines on you. And, you know, if there was something else that we could cut, some other way that we could handle these massive debts that we have, I mean, we've increased the tax. I, I think I'm paying over, I just looked at, I'm paying over 50% tax now, maybe 51 or 52%. And, and I, I hear the Minister of Finance talking about that going up again. Right. Now there's a limit to what you can do that. I mean, and then you start killing the goose that lays the golden egg. So, so yes, there's going to be increases in taxes and there's going to be cutting in public services. There's going to be much more efficiency in the public service. And I'm a, I'm a great believer in efficiency. I think that every business wouldn't survive unless you had a small overhead that you can get away with. But you said pay our debts. As people said, those bank debts weren't our debts. They were taken on by the state on our behalf. They shouldn't have been. Well, Matt, listen, I'm not a politician and I'm not here to provide the overall guidance for Ireland. I'm just, I'm here as a businessman trying to do business in Ireland. And I see but Ireland it, is still a very that, good place But do you business. worry that you won't be able to because of the reputational damage that has been caused to Ireland, because that other investors are looking askance at the Irish economic situation, they won't lend to our government, and that the state will fail even if entrepreneurs and manufacturers are still managing to export? Well, I suppose I can only tell you a little tale from, from Beijing, where I met uh, a, a, a very nice guy, Mr. Wenching Li, Liu, uh, from the China Development Bank, and he says, we, Mr. Eddie, we had a great time in Ireland, down in Kerry. I had the best time of my life. And he started singing. He broke into a song, and he started singing. And he said, we want to do business with you people, because we're not, they're not looking to the state here. I mean, it won't be the state that pays us for the electricity. It's going to be the customer who pays for the electricity. And there's nothing wrong with the Irish customer. The Irish customer, there's a lot of money in this country still. 
It's just we have to find ways of unlocking it. We have to make exports our goal here. Just as we do in the in the manufacturing sector, we have to recognise we can probably put 6,000 megawatts on land here in Ireland and, and we can make more big companies and we can make more jobs. Eddie O'Connor from Mainstream Renewable Park, thank you very much for taking the time to join.